Cars are great for getting around. You can drive them an almost unlimited distance. That's because there's a global network for distributing fuel. If that didn't exist, and you had to tow the fuel around from the day that you bought your car, you'd be towing tanker trailers stretching about 100 yards. It is impossible to imagine throwing away a car when you use up the first tank of fuel. But that's exactly the paradigm that we live with in the space industry. Now, personally, I've had to deal with the consequences of this. A company that I founded in 2011 tried to buy Express AM4, a telecommunications satellite that cost $400 million to build and should have brought in $6 billion of revenue. But because of a glitch in the rocket, it couldn't move to its orbit. It didn't have enough fuel. Because we couldn't get fuel to that satellite, we had to throw it away to avoid it becoming hazardous junk. Now, this is not a unique situation. This happens all the time. These are some of the satellites that in the last decade have had to be thrown away. $100 billion worth of assets, almost 200 satellites. It's time to now to start recovering some of that lost revenue. My name is Daniel Faber, and I'm the CEO of OrbitFab. We're building gas stations in space. I spent 20 years in the space industry, built a dozen satellites, several successful products. And I've been frustrated for too long by having a single tank of gas in my satellites. So we're solving this problem in a very simple way. We build these satellite gas tanks. We put them on any available rocket, which gives us the best deal across the industry. When they're in orbit, we manage the logistics and the orbital mechanics. We make the right fuel available to satellites where they need it. They come and get that fuel, and they realize capital sa uh, expenditure savings over 50%. We take home gross margins over 90%. Now, this might sound obvious, but there's a reason why this hasn't happened yet. That's because there's no secure and safe way to transfer fuel in orbit. So we set about solving that problem first. Now, it's once been said, once you get to orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system. So we like to think that we've built the key to the solar system. This is the gas cap. This small fueling port for satellites allows for safe and reliable transfer of fuel. But it's not quite as simple as it might seem. In space, there's no gravity to help fuel drain. So surface tension and other effects really complicate how the fluids behave. We solved that problem. We solved several other problems as well. And for the first time this week on the TechCrunch stage, we're going to show how it works. My co-founder, Jeremy, here is holding the active side of this system. You can see that it has four fingers, which can close securely around the fueling port. Now, we uh, looked at all the work that NASA had done working on fueling valves in space, and they assume that there are complex and expensive robots that can bring things together and align them carefully. But we see a future in which satellites are coming and going as part of a bustling economy. And therefore, they, they should be able to dock and undock without the need for complex and expensive robotic servicing assistance. So as you can see, the four fingers close around the fueling port, securely holding them together to transfer high-pressure propellants. When it's done, the satellite is released. It can go off into orbit and uh, continue making revenue. Thank you much, Jeremy. Back to the presentation. We've tested these, uh, these fueling ports, and, uh, and we built them specifically in this size and volume and, and low price so that they can be a drop-in replacement for the valves that are currently used to fill a satellite before it's launched. That means that we can get very rapid market adoption. Now, we've already tested a lot of our equipment. What you can see here are two test beds inside the International Space Station that we tested earlier this year. We transferred fuel between the two. We uh, tested the feed systems and the tanks. We actually used water in this case. We were able to hook it up to the International Space Station and supply the space station with water. As announced in TechCrunch, we became the first private company to resupply the space station with water. That, uh, that equipment that you see launched full of water to the space station. After its mission, we got it back here on Earth. This is actually the exact hardware that was in orbit just a couple of months ago. Now, this is not a science experiment. 
We worked with 20 companies to standardize this fueling port. They were looking for a fueling port standard. We have two contracts signed to deliver the first 10 units. We have contracts with the Air Force. We're collaborating with IHI, the Japanese conglomerate. We have a partnership with Lockheed. The team that's building this, you've already met me. My last company that I founded was building small thrusters that moved satellites around in orbit. That was acquired last December. Jeremy, my co-founder, international business background. Uh, he's the co-chair of uh, CONFERS, uh, an industry association, which is standardizing satellite servicing operations. James Bultitude, a brilliant young engineer. He's in his mid-20s. He's built five payloads for the International Space Station, has three satellites on orbit. He built this hardware that we put on the International Space Station, man-rated to, to NASA's standards, in four and a half months. Broke some speed records. So we're building the infrastructure layer that's needed for the future of the space industry to make sure satellites never need to be thrown away again. If your companies are building satellites, come and talk to us about the future. Judges. Can you talk about the unit economics of your business? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So the tankers that we launch, we work with the launch company, so we get a, a very good deal on that. But uh, actually, it was, was working with customers and talking to them that we first had that aha moment, we have to do this. Some of our customers said they could realize more than a million dollars of extra revenue for every kilogram of propellant that we could get them. Now, we think we can get propellant to orbit for as little as perhaps $1,000 per kilogram. So there are potentially three orders of magnitude arbitrage opportunity there. Now, that's when we decided there was probably a business in the middle. I like that you're working on a really hard problem, and it seems like you've made concrete progress. I think, uh, well, I can see how over the long run it can reduce waste. Do you have a way right now that you can retrofit existing satellites, or is it going to be a matter of launching all new satellites that have the proper receptors? Yeah, that's a really good question. We're not designing our systems to be backward compatible, but there are now 30 companies that are working on satellite servicing, effectively tow trucks in space. And they've had to design their business models around this paradigm that, uh, that refueling doesn't exist, which is like buying a tow truck, going and towing three cars, having to throw it away and buy a completely new tow truck. So they're our natural customers, and they have all the complex robotics and the ability to go and service satellites that weren't designed to be serviced or upgraded. So through them, we're able then to address the legacy systems. As we go forward, because we're equipping the whole industry with a fuel import standard, then we'll be able to go direct to customers. I'm curious if this is such a pain point for uh, companies that have launched satellites into space, why this hasn't been done before? Yeah, that's a really good question. Because there hasn't been a standard fueling port, that problem hadn't been solved. Because the rendezvous and docking technologies hadn't been solved, they have been solved now, and that's, uh, that's why the timing is right here. But also because the industry is extremely conservative. So they've had business models that have worked very well before, they're now feeling that those business models are threatened by, by the new constellations that are going up, by the changes in the industry. So they're much more open to innovation and embracing this type of idea. So it's become more of a problem that's front of mind, and the perceptions in the industry have shifted to, to needing this kind of capability. So like they're scared by SpaceX and Blue Origin? Pardon? They're scared by SpaceX and Blue Origin. That is one of the effects that's going on in the industry, yeah. Uh, OneWeb also, mega constellations, those types of things. There are several trends that have pushed bigger companies to really think a lot more innovatively and be looking for solutions like this. Are you still beholden to, to your launch partner? Could they jack up your prices at some point? Because yeah, we, you're doing well and they see that you're making good gross margins, so they extract that by saying, hey, we're going to charge you more. Yeah, sure, we considered that, and we do see the potential of competition from launch companies, but it just, didn't, just in the way that, uh, that United doesn't sell fuel to, uh, to Delta and to the other, the other companies, Swissport is that layer. Similarly, the companies that are making those fuels don't sell directly to the airlines. Swissport is that, that layer, that infrastructure for airline industry. We don't expect that there'll be competition from the launch vehicles because we can buy from any of the vehicles, and that then lets us uh, benefit from the economies of scale on the supply side and similarly on the demand side. Can you talk about the lifetime of a satellite today and how that coincides with the amount of fuel that's on that satellite? In yeah, absolutely. Mismatch? So because they've had to design satellites with all the fuel that they've needed, yeah. they've put up satellites traditionally into the geostationary orbit where most of the big communication satellites are, with 15 years worth of fuel. So that's, that means that most of the satellite when it launched was fuel. Now, 
because of these new uh, challenges to the business models, there's no flexibility if you launch with 15 years worth of fuel. If the market shifts, if the technology shifts, you get stuck. You're with an asset that's no longer as valuable as you thought. So they're searching for that flexibility, which is why they're looking now for these types of solutions. So the drive now is to make satellites that have shorter lifetimes, but then build them with the option to be able to extend that lifetime. And you can't do that unless you've got a supply of fuel. I love the authenticity of the idea to you guys as founders. Um, it, it sounds like, though, that this isn't a problem that, that has been a huge industry secret for a long time. So are there other competitive offerings out there or potential solutions that will emerge over time that you're, you're worried about or that you've heard of? Yeah, there definitely are uh, thoughts that have gone into this for the last few decades. But all of those business models, they haven't had, um, to be honest, somebody who's had a depth of experience in both entrepreneurship and the space industry. So they don't have an MVP. Uh, one of the companies that is uh, in, in this space is trying to raise a Series A of $500 million. We don't think businesses should be designed like that. So we're very much trying to get this off the ground with a small amount of capital. And we brought down the capital requirements from hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to only $20 million. It seems that uh, the assumed lockout is the coupling nature uh, between the valve and, and the distribution device. C couldn't, couldn't a competitor come in once you actually build a market and you have this, the, 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 the called the male or the female fitting, couldn't they just come in and retrofit the other side of, of fitting in some way, shape, or form, uh, and, and, then, and, and then basically take all of your long tail over time? Yeah, that's a very good point. So the patents that we have around the fueling port and the agreements we have around its use uh, and how it's deployed are one part of our defensive strategy. But also, once we have propellant in orbit and we've built out that inventory, that's another defensive, uh, you know, another part of the moat that we have. So there's several different layers that we have to being able to defend this business. It's not just reliant on that fueling port standard. However, once it's a de facto standard in the industry, it's, uh, it's very hard then for somebody to try and replicate all of that and build a completely new ecosystem uh, with which they can then compete with us. My next question is, space is very big. Uh, <laughs> so where do you put a fueling station or how do you actually just work with people that are launching things into an orbit that you're going to be operating in? Yeah, really good question. So there are a few main orbits where people put satellites. The geostationary orbit is one of them. So we'll have a tanker very close to that. Uh, also in low Earth orbit, there are different inclinations. So most of the Earth observation satellites are at 98 degrees inclination. And the communications constellations are at 90 or 70 degrees. The International Space Station is at 55 degrees, which means there's a lot of activity there. So those are the orbits that we're going to start with tankers in. And then we'll respond to demand as people want to put tankers in different places. But those are really the main places we start. You are moving around several hundred million dollar satellites. Who's ensuring this? Yeah, very good question. At the moment, there's a, a robust industry around insuring satellites and assets. Uh, and the, I mentioned before the 30 companies that are looking to stand up uh, satellite servicing and building those tow trucks. Um, you know, they include Northrop Grumman, Prime Contractors, Maxar, uh, all the way down to, to new startups. Uh, those companies are having to confront those issues head on. And so we can ride a little bit behind, the, uh, behind those. But then Jeremy's also a vice chair at Confers, helping to standardize those operations. And a lot of that work is with the insurance and financial industries to understand that risk, to understand how to mitigate it, both from a financial perspective, an insurance perspective, but also a technical perspective. So a lot of efforts are going on in that direction. We're in the middle of those conversations. Final question. All right, one more round of applause for Orbit Fab. <laughs> <laughs>